All right, good evening, everybody. My name is Kevin. Welcome back to the stream. This is the ESP32 product creation journey where we are making a consumer product based on an ESP32 module, going all the way from hardware design, having that uh, fabricated and assembled all the way up through firmware, back end, Internet of Things, end to end, uh, showing the process that uh, you have to go through to go from an idea to an actual product. So for those that may just be joining, very quick recap. The original product was this. It's a hockey puck. It's an actual real hockey puck that is uh, machined out and has a little e-paper display in it. Very sad because we lost to the New York Rangers today, which now makes us fourth in the division. That sucks. Uh, but we are redesigning changing the main chip in that as well as the form factor to be a holder, a, a puck holder. Same thing, the screen will go right there and uh, you'll put your puck just right here. So that is what we're working on. And earlier today, we wrote a, we finished up writing a sketch. Let's open that up here. To have our device constantly hit if this then that, the service, IFTTT, I'm not sure I, if uh, to send the battery level because one of the things that we're adding to the hardware design is battery level detection and so uh, it's been going all day and i basically want to see how it holds up showing me the battery level over time and the way we did that was it goes out to um the if this then that service which then has it populate a row in a google sheets and the result is this and bring it over here, you can't see that, is this. And so you see this is uh, over here at the start of the day, it was right around 4.2 volts. Now this is showing about 1100 millivolts because we voltage divided, we are voltage dividing the 4.2 volts of the battery when it's fully charged down into a range that's 1.1 volt and lower. Uh, the onboard ADC for the ESP32's default voltage, reference voltage is 1100 millivolts, give or take uh, a few millivolts there, um, depending on your, it's different with every chip. They each have a, a slightly different um, voltage reference, but for our purposes, close enough, 1100 millivolts or 1.1 volt. And you can see it was pretty flat there. And then it's been kind of, you know, slowly on its way down. And now we're below a thousand way out here. And so kind of cool, just a simple way to see, uh, how the battery looks over time. And if this is a viable way to, uh, check the battery level. And so, uh, cool that it's going down. I just measured. Um, so this is the value we're getting from the ADC in this column. When we first started, we were at 4.2 volts. This is straight off the battery with a meter. And the AD, the the meter was saying that uh, the same thing that the ADC is measuring was at 1,044 millivolts. So you can see there's a little bit of an error there. Uh, I'm not too worried about it. We could make that better with calibration, but again, I don't need this to be exact. It's just a battery level indicator. Close enough is good enough. All the way down 600 readings later, right around here, uh, you can see now we're, we're reading about 989 millivolts. The actual meter was reading 977 millivolts and the battery that corresponds to a battery voltage of about 3.88 volts. The battery will go all the way down to, oh, what will it go all the way down to? It depends on the, let's switch the view here. Nope, not that one, this one. So the, let me get my pointer. The battery itself has, oh, I can use this one actually to show you. So it has a, a circuit board in it. If you can see it through the capped on tape, it's got some components right here. So the cell itself is inside of here. And then it's got a teeny little PCB right on the front here that's wrapped in the captain tape. Uh, there we go, that gets rid of the glare. That uh, is basically a battery, it's not a BMS, it's what's it called? Uh, it's like a BMS, it's a battery management. It checks for things like short circuits to protect the battery. And um, it'll also keep it from discharging below a certain amount because these batteries, these these uh, LiPo batteries, if you discharge them below, I, I want to say three volts, if they get any lower than that, 
they're pretty much lost. Like you can't, you can't juice them back up. Like there's no recharging them after that. And so um, almost all modern lipos come with some kind of uh, built-in regulation like that, that prevents them. Like it'll disconnect the cell when it gets down to a certain voltage level. And so this will go all the way down to somewhere around there. I want to say 3.2, 3.3 volts. And then the, um, so if we look at our circuit here, you can kind of see not the square chip right here, but the one right next to it right there. That's our linear voltage regulator. That's going to take an input voltage and create 3.3 volts. So if we drop below 3.3 volts, we're not going to be able to maintain that anyway. The ESP32 is going to start browning out. And so it'll be time to charge the battery. And what I would like to do and what I currently don't offer in uh, this guy, the, the puck product, the screen looks really great is uh, an indication that your battery is getting low. So right now we just tell people if it stops updating, it's likely that your battery needs to be charged. And the power on this is very low. So it can go a whole season if you've got good Wi-Fi coverage. So if you're far from your, from your router, you might get a little less because it's a little harder and takes a little longer to connect. But if you're in good Wi-Fi range, you can easily get a half season, almost a full season on a single charge with the current battery. And so... It's not something that you really, it's not like a phone, you know, where you charge it every day or every week even. This is a, you charge it every few months. And so it'd be nice if there was some kind of an indicator of like, hey, the battery's getting low. Now's a good time to charge it um, just as an extra feature to the product. So that is what we were working on earlier today. And this has worked beautifully, by the way. Let me switch the view back here. This spreadsheet has worked out amazing. Like it's just, uh, I guess I could look and see 54. I'm, excuse me. I'm having it check in twice a minute. So like I could come through here, I guess, and look and see 56, 57, 57. Like, I don't think it's missed a reading. Like it's been pretty solid. What a, it's been a nice way to, again, look at the, the battery over time and what this should do eventually I actually have it over here is you'll see the discharge curve it'll it'll drop down and then it's going to be in this sort of linear drop and then when it gets to a certain voltage it just kind of falls off a cliff um <clears throat> and so we're right in where are we we're like right in this range right here so um we'll see how long we are in this sort of linear phase and then dip down. I, we, we didn't see this. Um, and it could just be the, well, yeah, I mean, it's really just very gradual linear. And so anyway, we just need to see where we, you know, where we fall off a cliff and we can use that to uh, notify our users that they need to charge the battery. So, all right, so that we're just going to keep that running. Uh, that was really great. I think I'm satisfied at this point to say that we can use this little voltage divider circuit as a way to monitor the battery. Again, as I mentioned in a previous stream, we only like we don't have to do anything in firmware right now. We just we put it on the hardware, which again is over here. And if we want to enable it, we'll write firmware to read from an ADC pin, which we're, we're gonna connect this voltage divider to after getting the voltage from the battery. And just as I've said that, I think we're gonna to have to rethink a bit how we're gonna do that. Hmm, okay, let me turn on the back copper here. Okay, so let's, um, let's do it. And again, just to show here from the schematic view, this is where we're going to take the battery, we're going to voltage divide it, and I put it into IO35. We might want to reconsider that. And the reason for that is, stand by, I'm looking at the data sheet. This is not the data sheet I'm looking for. This is the data sheet I'm looking for. IO15 and IO2. Are we using those? Oh, those are MTDI. 
These are all no connects. Okay, what about... Okay, like 12 here. What is 12? That looks to be IO 27. So in the data sheet, which I can pull over so that you can follow along at home. That's not what I meant to do. I want to put it in the same. There we go. Okay, so we're talking about, this is upside down. So you can see the keep out zone is right here. If we look at, if we zoom out here, the keep out zone is down here. So the chip is just upside down from the data sheet. So right here, IO 12, 14, and 27 is open. And so let's see what IO 27 has available on it. Did I just, oh, here we go. ADC2, channel seven. Right now, I have it connected to what? Right in here. It's not IO32. It's right below IO32. So let's look at the data sheet. IO35 is what I have it connected to now, which is ADC1. And I read something... Let's see if it's in the data sheet here. That said, you cannot use ADC2 while the Wi-Fi is turned on, which feels crazy to me. It doesn't seem to be in this data sheet. Let's look in the... I'm in a different data sheet here. It was in the some Arduino code. ESP thirty two eighty C two Wi Fi. Let's do that. Here we go. I can't read all ADCs to channel all values incorrect. Yeah, here we go. This happens because ADC2 pins cannot be used when Wi-Fi is used. And so we could do some, you know, smarts there to say, well, when it's time to read the battery level, we will make sure the Wi-Fi is not turned on. But that sucks. I don't know. That that seems like extra stuff to have to deal with. And uh just waiting for a bug to happen. Like some change will happen where I won't remember that. And I'll try and read the, the ADC when the Wi-Fi is enabled and everything's going to go to crap. So we want to make sure we're connecting to ADC one, which right now, what did I say? I was connected to 32, 35. So back in the data sheet here, IO 35 is ADC one. So that's fine. The problem is, is we have to get, so the only place that we have the battery voltage is right here. It's this fat green line right over here. I guess we could pop up right through here maybe and get to it. So anyway, we've got to get the voltage from up here or somewhere along this route right here all the way over to IO32. And I was just thinking maybe it would be easier to get it from here over to this pin. It doesn't look like it's going to be any easier that way. So we'll just stick with... IO35, the way that we have it now. And uh, that'll be just fine. We'll, we'll figure out how to make it work. Okay, so I think schematic wise, we are complete. And now it's just, it's time to play the puzzle game of routing the board, which I'm not pretending particularly looking forward to in this case because I think we're going to have some tough sledding here. Okay.
Buy Vault comes under. So right away, first of all, we need to let's let's solve this problem up here first. I changed the connector. I moved the connector in the schematic so you can see I have a new version of it here, which is the same as this version. And so I don't know if I can just get rid of this version. Um, but I want to align them. And I feel like there was a thing yesterday when I was looking, if I hold shift and I highlight them both and I do position relative to, I think that's going to apply to both of them though. Reference item, none selected. Okay. What if I select just this and say, how would I set it as a reference? Reference item, none selected. I don't really want to watch a video about it. You know what? Forget it. Let's just let's just delete this one and throw this one on in its place. So let's highlight this one. And it needs to be on the bottom. You can see right now that it defaults to be on the top later layer. You can tell that because you can see it, the indicator right here is J2. And this one is J2 as well, but it's it's mirrored because it's on the bottom layer of the PCB and I need to change the grid for sure right now because it is huge. I'm going to change the grid down to ten mils. Yeah. Let's stay a little bigger. Let's go twenty mils. Okay. And then the track yeah, here we go. Uh, let's default it to six mils. This one's bigger. Let's look at and see what this track is right here. Not J2, the... Well, these both... Yeah, there we go. It is in millimeters, so we'd want to change it to mils, which it's been a while. Here we go. There we go. Now if we hit E, we'll see that's a 20 mil trace. Okay. All right, so let's grab this guy and just, well, first of all, let's update from schematic. Make sure we don't have any, there's no other changes. Great. So if we delete that, let's, uh, it's not gonna fit right about the same. It's gonna be a little, it's going to be slightly different. So I need to change the grid. Let's go down to 10 mils. Man, it was really placed. Let's go down to 5 mils. All right, that's going to get us right where we want to be. Okay. And then I think if I just do, okay, footprint J2 on bottom copper, front copper. So let's select bottom and let's delete. And then we wanna put this on the bottom and I don't, yeah, I know. They and in board view, cast what's up. Um, in board view layout, they <laughs> depending on the grid, it's hard to it's snapping is hard, much easier in the schematic view. Uh, okay, uh, not flip. I want to send it. Oh, I can't remember. It's been a while since I've done the layout, and especially this is something I don't do a lot, which is we just want to send it to the back layer. We don't want to flip it. Do we want to flip it? 
Let's flip it. That's not what I want to do. <laughs> um, you know, properties. It's going to be layer mm, board side right there. Back. Okay. Oh, and it flips it that way. Okay, so now we now we do want to Ugh. And, uh, that is wrong. No, we've got this wrong. Flip it, but we need it to be on the back. That's the problem. Um, why are we having such a hard time here? Board side. Back. And it's going to flip it. So the flip did do that. But it needs to be oriented the other way. Like, it needs to be pointing this way on the back. Oh, shoot. I think I know what's going on. Dang on it. So I think I remember having to do this before. The the nets are wrong. So what I mean by that is this is let's watch this. We're gonna control Z all the way out of here. We're gonna control Z our way out of this mess. Here we go. Okay. If you can, if you see now what I'm talking about is they're oriented the correct way. And, and this is not pin one is ground and pin two is VBAT. Yes, that's right. So the pin names are correct. So I'm going to do a flip and this puts it on the back. Let's see. And then I want to like mirror it is what we want to do. How do we do that? Hmm. It's not a flip or like we really just want to mirror it about. Did I create a special footprint for this one over here? I don't think so. Orientation through hole, board side back, like all that looks fine. And then, yeah, I don't, here we go, library reference, let's see, S2BPH, this is the value I think we need to look at right here. Um, okay, so JSTPH, S2BPHK, you know what, I'm just going to take a screenshot of it, it's the easiest way. And then I just need to slap that into something so I can see it. And we'll just put it in that, that Google sheet we've been using as our battery tester. Let's we'll see if I just paste it right here. Okay, there we go. And then this one, cancel. There's got to be a way to mirror it. Cass, you know how to mirror it? Those are the exact same connectors. Okay. All right, so there's just got to be a way to, now that we have this on the back side, Yeah, see, now ground is the, like they're swapped. I swear there was like a way to flip it horizontally. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I swear there's a way to do that. I mean, I had to have done something the first time to get it in there right. Oh, jeez. I don't want to rotate. I don't want to move. A flip puts it on the right side. Duplicate now. Copy, paste. Open in footprint. Select locking. Forward side back. Jeez. I don't know. This is going to like really taking the wind out of my sails here. <clears throat> I did? I had to edit the actual footprint? Uh, let's, let's take a look. Let's do open a footprint editor. I know I did the footprint for the display connector. Wow, it is really loading footprints there, isn't it? Oh, okay, you you did it. Um, yeah, let's just well, that's taking its time loading. Um, mirror footprint in I think it's PCB new is what it's called. You can right click and mirror the immediate. Uh, no, I don't believe that. I don't believe it. And select the specific footprint and right click footprint editor. Oh, mirror. Okay. Okay. All right. Looks like you're exactly right. I guess, I mean, I guess I would have had to have done that. Uh, did footprint editor ever? Oh, yes, it did. Okay. J2, but, but, like, wouldn't I have done that in, like, a custom? I would have, like, a, I had, I hear my stat feeder. Logo, these are all other parts. Wild. Okay, so... Just right in here, I select it. How do I mirror it again? I just had it open. Oh, and I closed it. Genius. I click that. Once the footprint editor is open, you can right click and mirror, and immediately the component is mirrored. Okay. So you're saying in footprint editor. Well, I don't want to. I'm in footprint editor for the wrong one. So let's let's close that out. So I want to. This is on the back. I want to rotate it. And I want to. I want to mirror it now. So let's <laughs> open footprint in editor. What's up, super user? I love the CH mod seven seven seven. That's great. Okay, and from here I can right click and say mirror. Lies. Uh, pads. No. Uh, you've done this before. Help me out. Give me the mirror. Yeah, when you say flip the connector, like it was saying that I should be able to just mirror it from in here. You're saying I can't do that?
I swear, there's got to be a mirror right here. Dunk. Just like that. I selected the whole thing and just did mirror. I don't know. I'm going to hit save. Yeah. There we go. I got it. Okay. All right, now that looks exactly how we had it before. This is so dumb that I just, just by moving the connector, I've got to do this. Like, I feel like this is dumb, but whatever it is, it is what it is. Okay, now the question is, all right, I'm gonna do that and then I'm gonna select the old one, delete it and then slide this over right there okay and now we're that just took so much longer than i wanted it to take okay but the good news is is it's in and it's correct and we're all set now from here we've got a few ugh, i don't like this at all it's already tight. So we've some so the new things that we have to route for those that have never seen this before, you can see all these white lines going everywhere. It's called the rat's nest. Um, that's showing you all the things that you haven't connected. But most of these, if you look, are ground connections. So ground, ground, ground. This one spiders off right here. And those will all get filled when we uh, fill. Huh, I, they'll get filled when we fill when we fill the, the the copper so right now if i press b it's going to fill in copper everywhere and you can see all those white lines disappear and the only ones left are these resistors right here and these two connections right here and these are the ones that i'm really worried about is i've got to get these two things down to here which sucks i'm going to, have to figure out how to do that uh, and then i've got to get you know these this resistor this uh, voltage divider connected up and linked into this pin over here. And so I'm going to hit control B, which is going to unfill. And then all these go back to unconnected, which, you know, is fine. And so what we need to do is decide where we're going to put these resistors. And I believe they're both 0402s. Does it tell me in here? Yeah, right here. Uh, you probably, yeah, you can't see that. It's really small. Uh, 0402 resistor is just a very, very small resistor let's switch views for just a second do a little bit of knowledge share i'm not going to use that because i'm afraid of disconnecting it so here's the old um hardware but it's got a lot of the same components on it um you can see like this capacitor right here is huge and i can't remember i think that's a 12 um and then you've got different sizes i think this is 08 oh i can't ever remember 08 oh five anyway 12 8 and then right here these there's two resistors right there those are 0402 um so most of the resistors on here are 0402 there's some bigger ones eduardo what's up yeah 042 package side yeah it is way small and yes it can be hand soldered uh with a very, very steady hand and a great pair of tweezers. You need an excellent pair of tweezers to get that started. But uh, it can be done. you got to have the right tip as well um, when you're soldering. I, I use like a little, uh, it's actually got solder on it right now. But, you know, it's a, it's a basically a needle tip. Um, but, yeah, not something you want to be hand soldering. And... Um, for this particular project, none of it's hand soldered. It's all, it'll be assembled at the uh, fab house. So, um, so yeah, uh, we got to find a place to put them. And so what you might be thinking, let me switch back the view here. What you might be thinking is like, hey, look at all this empty area up here. Well, the problem with that, and we, and we may have room, is one of the other things that we need to do to you know today is in the case for this a support structure comes right off of this standoff and comes right through here 
And uh, so we have to move. I'm actually going to be moving R4, R3, R, R1 through R4. I'm going to be moving. Um, we'll do that later. And so we need to be careful because the same support structure comes through up here uh, and just actually barely misses this pin. In fact, I should probably, while we're here, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to slide this down a little bit. Let's. Let's get rid of this and let's actually do that. I'm going to slide it ever so slightly down to give us even more room on that support. And then we're going to grab this. That is a 20 mil and I, there's a setting. I can't remember. Oh gosh, it's been a while. Is it this right here? Auto track width. Yes, we want to have that turned on which means it'll just pick the size. See how it matched the size? I'm gonna hit escape and I'm gonna turn that off. And it's going to default to this six mil. So if I try to pick up right here, you're gonna see it's gonna have that tiny little track and that's not what we want. So we wanna definitely have this turned on for now, which is auto size it. And I hate that it goes off to the side like that and not right into the middle, but it's fine. It's fine. Okay. So that's good. And uh, great. So I think we could actually put the voltage divider right up here. Like we do have plenty of room here. Eduardo, that's a great question. He's asking, how do I determine the sizes of traces for this project? That is a great question that my answer is going to be take with a grain of salt because I am not a professional PCB designer. Now I think is a good time to remind anybody that's watching, watching that part of this whole experiment in making this product is trying to prove a thesis that you don't have to spend like your entire life savings to build an Internet of Things product. A lot of it you can learn and just uh, find ways to not have VC money or be independently wealthy to do this. And so for a lot of this, it's all self-taught and I'm still learning as I go. I do have an electrical engineering degree for what that's worth from 20 years ago. And so I have a, a basic understanding obviously of um, electronics and current and voltage and power and all those things. But um, for selecting the trace sizes, there's a couple of factors that go into that. One is what can your fab house handle? So at the end of all this, we're gonna submit these files to, I've been using PCB way. You can use whoever you want. I know uh, somebody else reached out recently was using a, uh, oh, it's called JL PCB, I think. Anyway, there's like infinity fab houses around the world um, that you can use, but they'll have a set of limitations of like how small they can go on trace width and how close the traces can be together. So like. Uh, they'll have a minimum trace width and you can see like i don't even know if these are as close as they can do but they can only put them so close together um eduardo it's funny you mentioned that uh, he said uh osh park is a pretty good uh way to go also i have used them the purple boards uh, i don't have one handy that i could show but i can never remember if i say osh park or osh park anyway uh another great fab house that will do a low cost turnaround this used to be crazy expensive. And now like we live in the most amazing times, everybody like this stuff is so affordable. Um, so anyway, you, you have to meet the minimum specs of your fab house. And then once you have those, you can actually just put them in. I believe it's right here, board setup, uh, design rules. And you can see minimum track width. I have set to six mils. I don't know why. Oh, um, I don't know why these are these are crazy mills because my fab house does the minimums in um, millimeters, not mills. And so that's why these numbers are all funky. Um, but anyway, you can set that all up here. Tracks and vias. You can see I've got track widths, standard widths here, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, all the way up through 20 mils. And then vias. Vias, for those that are new, are these little guys right here. Let's zoom in on them. The red means it's on the top of the board. The green means it's on the bottom of the board. This is a two layer board. And so a via is just a, a hole that punches through, it's coated. And so it's a 
it's a solid conductor from the top layer of the board to the bottom layer of the board. And so you set all those. Now, Eduardo, sorry, I'm trying to like give all the information to other people. Um, is coming up with the trace width. Most signals on a simple board like this can be as small as you want um, and as small as your fab house can go to make room. The, the one thing that you need to worry about with trace width are things, the biggest one in this kind of a project is current. How much current are you gonna be pushing through it? Because it's just a thin piece of copper and if you pump too much current through it, it's gonna get really hot and it can actually melt, turn into a fuse basically. And so I've done six mil pretty much everywhere except for the power lines. And you can see that here, like this is 3.3 volts going up to um, a header up here, uh, which we may have to ditch to give us room. That's a good thing. I'm glad we're talking about this. This is five volts coming off uh, down here to our PMIC. And then this is the battery 20 mil. So most of the current for this project is coming out of the battery. And with a 20 mil trace, you can pump a lot of current before it's going to get so hot that it melts like a lot. And so 20 mil is probably way overkill on this. And you can look those things up just based on the thickness of the copper. And these are all fab house specs again that you specify based on the thickness of that trace and the width. It'll tell you based on cross sectional area, how much current you can put through it. And so I just, the science on this was, I'm just going to make them as big as I can. And they're probably oversized at that. Like this, I will never pull more than six, 700 milliamps out of the battery on this particular project. And I think through this 20 mil trace, I could probably pull a couple of amps. It's going to get hot, but it's not going to spontaneously combust. So uh, six mil is what I've done pretty much everywhere because there's very low current going through. These are all signal traces. And so I don't have to worry about anything like that. And then I just made the, the power ones fat, as fat as I could. So not a lot of precise science there, but one thing that definitely you should know about all of this is a lot of this is a very imprecise, like good enough is good enough. Um, and so that's how I came up with the trace widths. Uh, super user, great question. Did I start on a breadboard? Yes, I did. Um, I started the whole design on a breadboard about two years ago. Um, and then I came up with the, the first version of the hardware, this board about a year ago, and now I'm working on V2 of the hardware. And so, but anyway, so I'm trying to prove this thesis of you can do this. Like it's taking more time. Certainly I could pay somebody to do this and I'm going to save you some time on that. Be prepared to spend tens of thousands of dollars to have this all done by a firm that specializes in this. And it's an interesting trade-off because it, it, is a, a, it is a skill and there's a lot to know about it. And it can be dangerous only if you're dealing in a dangerous domain. Like if, if I was connecting this to wall mains, for example, there's a lot of additional things that I would be worried about. This is battery powered. It's a standalone device. And so uh, I think there's a lot of room between, you know, paying a firm tens of thousands of dollars because I got quotes on this stuff and just gaining the knowledge yourself and and putting it together and doing your best. And again, it's so cheap to send these over and have them fab and assembled that there's no reason not to at least give it a shot. Like again, um, somebody, Eduardo brought up um, Osh Park. Osh Park or Osh Park? If you can tell me how you pronounce it, uh, Eduardo, um, you can do these things for tens of dollars. You can get the boards turned around. Now, in my case where I'm not soldering these, um, I pay for assembly, but assembly is so cheap. I mean, I think I paid for the last batch of these. The assembly on this was, uh, I can't remember. It, it was not, it was not much at all. It was like a hundred dollars for five prototype boards fully assembled with everything on them. Like it's really, it's really doable. A lot of a lot of firms add a markup that is utterly insane. It is utterly insane. Like I have gotten quotes on all parts of this process, and you could easily blow a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars. And this again is back to my thesis of you don't have to, it might take you a little longer, but you can do it. Like, and so trade your time for money. And if you don't have the money, 
I don't have a couple hundred thousand dollars laying around and I don't have a VC firm knocking down my door to give me money for this. Um, so we're doing it this way and I'm sharing the journey so other people can, you know, maybe be inspired a little bit or just see what it takes and uh, give it a shot themselves. So uh, do you separate your signal traces and power traces on separate layers or is that not needed overkill? <laughs> you say Osh Park. Yeah. I think I switch every time I say, I say it Osh Park, like a next video, I'll say Osh Park. Like I always do that. So great question. Do you separate signal and power on this board? No, sort of. That really comes, that is really important when you have higher power and you get a lot of noise um, and higher frequencies. Like if you're doing some sort of radio stuff and you're dealing with high frequencies or antenna design, like that starts to really that separation of like power and signal is really important. And something like this, um, it it does not matter and hasn't mattered. Like I've had no issues with it, with the exception of, and I'll show you um, what I mean. You can see that this green kind of does this wonky <laughs> move out here when it could just come through here and come down. Because all I'm trying to do is get five volts from this point way up here to this point down here. The reason I did that is because USB supposedly, again, I didn't test this, um, but a lot of the things you'll read about USB, which comes in off the micro USB connector right here. Um, you've got your data positive and data negative coming through is the way USB works is it's a differential voltage. And so it's not just ones and zeros. It's like the difference in voltage between the two wires. And it's very susceptible to noise once it gets out into the open. And if you've gone to school for any of this, you learn about like the right hand rule, how like when current is going and you hold your right hand, like it creates a field, a magnetic field around the direction of current. And so what I was worried about, and I actually don't know if it matters, is, is if I ran this power line straight through these data signals right here, that it would be just enough to create issues on the USB bus and would give me problem. Like I, I felt like it might create hard to nail down issues like dropped bits here and there that screw up the protocol. So I basically just drove around the block here to avoid that. I don't know if it was necessary, um, but that's the only place on this board that I've separated power and data. Um, you can do different planes. You can do four layer boards, six layer boards and have different layers that have um, power signals running through it and versus data signals. I don't do any of that here. Um, it, it, I'm with my limited experience saying it's, it's unnecessary and it has been like, it, I've had no issues with the board, with the power running and a lot of these signals crossing over each other. It hasn't been an issue at all. Again, it's so small current, it's low frequency. Um, so it's not a big deal. <clears throat> Oh, don't use migrant cast. Like, uh, let's see, you can go through. Okay, great. Uh, I'm glad you brought this up. I'm going to address it. I, I addressed it in a couple of streams ago, but I'm glad you're here to talk about it. I actually, that was one of the changes I was going to consider, which was changing this micro USB to be USB-C because, you know, it's 2021. Like, why am I not using USB-C? And what I found out, Right as I was, because you're right, you can actually just do a simple wiring change, which it would not have been, it would have taken a little bit more real estate on the board, but it wouldn't have been an issue. And you can actually just wire it up and use it just like USB 2. Uh, the problem that I found is that USB C connectors are very hard to come by in supply chains, especially when you're my size, which is nobody cares about you small. Um, there's just not a lot of stock like through DigiKey and stuff. And so what I didn't want to run into, um, like when I was looking at the DigiKey parts, there were maybe a couple of thousand on hand, whereas the micro USB connectors, there were hundreds of thousands on hand. And so I didn't want to create a squeeze when I need to order like a batch of 500 of these. If I can't get the supply for micro USB, uh, for USB-C, excuse me, so I stuck with micro USB for now. I intend to move the USB-C just when the logistics work out a little bit better. Um, so 
So yes, USB-C, uh, I'm all on board with that. Right now, logistically, it's in much, much lower supply, order of magnitude lower supply than micro USB. <clears throat> they have connectors. Yeah, I, I hear you on that. Okay, where should we put these resistors? I'm thinking up here, but then we've somehow got to get a, we've got to get a trace. So now might be a good time to reconsider. If you're looking at this, I was trying to, to do two things at once with this. Um, one is obviously the product that I'm building. The second was I wanted it to be available as a dev board for other people to use. And let's switch the view. All right, our little battery test running here. So in, in my product, when I ship it, this button and this button will not be placed. Like they do not need to be there. They are strictly for use when I'm messing around and prototyping. Um, actually through the micro USB to the FTDI chip that's right here, I can control everything as far as resetting the ESP32 over a USB uh, connection. I don't need physical buttons to program it or reset it or do anything like that, which is really cool. Um, so those won't, actually won't be there. And then this 10 pin header, the only reason that's there is because I thought it would be cool as like a dev kit because what as an e-paper dev kit. So you've got this um, e-paper display, 1.54 inch that can plug into this connector over here. It's got an ESP32, which has got Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Uh, USB, it's charging, it can run off a of LiPo. It's kind of like a really cool dev kit for e-paper that I was going to make available for people, like makers to buy, like through a Tindy. Um, additionally to making the product. And so as part of that though, I broke out uh, up here on this header, you can see I've got 3.3 volts, I've got ground. Nope, you can't see it because we got to change the view back. 3.3 volts, ground, and then I've got these IO pins. I also broke out the SPI that goes to the display in case you wanted to add another SPI device. And so these run up through here and are kind of clogging up the, the lanes, as it were. And maybe they're creating too much traffic. Maybe we need to get rid of Maybe we need to get rid of some of them to make room for what we're trying to do. So let's come in here. We've got room right in here to come out and then we could come up through here. And right here we're, we're running into, we need to drop down underneath. We do have some room up here. We still have to get these traces right here, this power enable and VCD. We could run them down through here, right here. That's gonna work and tie them right to there. Okay, so let's, let's start with those. Um, yeah, let's start with those. So we've gotta get power enable is on the bottom BCD battery charge detect and we've got to get them they're opposite it doesn't matter we've got room and again on these I just you know went through that whole bit about not wanting to run the 5 volt line across the data lines here I think it would be okay for us to run very small signal lines on the bottom side of the board because it's got the whole um, PCB material in between. That Those I do not anticipate causing any sort of issue um, with the, the, the USB data. What is 
this. I don't know what that is. It's on the silk screen layer, but I don't know what it's. Oh, these are diodes. Okay, that's that's telling you where the those are TVS diodes. Okay, that's the that's the symbol on the board that tells you which the orientation of the diode. Okay. Great. So let's start with that. And what we can do is uh, we're going to just take six mils. We're going to come off of here and then we're going to immediately go. I think it's space. Oh, how do I get? There's a shortcut to bust a via through. Oh, might, I think it might just be V. Oh, that's gigantic. Okay, we need to set the the via size to be reasonable. Like these sizes. What size are these? Uh, 23 and 11. All right, so let's set the via to 2311. Okay. And then let's grab power enable first. Oh, I want to change the grid uh, back up to 10. Okay. So we're going to come, well, we need to be on the wire. We're going to come off here and then we're going to do V. Oh, it's okay. I guess we can do right there. And then basically let's, just run down through here. And then uh, we need to pop it up somewhere. Do we have enough room right here? Like that. And then just come right in. Okay. I think that works. So again, green's on the bottom, so it's going to pop out of the chip here, punch through the board to the bottom. It's going to run right down under here and pop up here to power enable. And that I need the, I need the BCD to be on the other side cuz it's got to come down and come in Oh, no, I don't. Um, let's control Z that. Let's come through the other side. Nope, wrong side of the board. Um, I want to be on the bottom layer. Mm. Try this again. Okay, we're gonna come off of here. We're gonna, oh, I didn't, dang it. We're gonna punch a via right there. And then this time I wanna come, yeah, I wanna come through this way. I can't come through that way. Yeah, I can. No, I can't. Let's just go around the circle there. Okay, I can't. Durr. There we go. Uh, I can't put a via right there because it's too big. Okay, so that's fine. We'll leave it right there for now. Um, and now let's take BCD is got to come. We can't come through here because that's we need to get all the way over to here. Hmm. This is where the puzzle and this is really all PCB layout is like it's you lay out all the components, you space them out, and then it's a puzzle of 
it's a, it, I, I call it a packing puzzle. Like how well can you pack the components in? And then you've got to be able to connect them without crossing lines. And like now we need to get, oh, I guess we can go right here. We could put, and then we could come under here. And if we're on this side, uh, we could do some like weird, like pop up, come over, go back under, come up here. The question is BCD, let's, take, let's, let's think about this for a second. BCD and power enable are configurable pins on the FTDI chip. So that's the CBUS pins. So they are not fixed in that. I could just as easily make CBUS one power enable and CBUS zero. Oh, sorry, I could just easily make CBUS one BCD and CBUS zero power enable. And I almost feel like if these were switched, I'd have an easier time. Because what's not negotiable is that this needs to be BCD down here and this needs to be power enabled down here going into the PMIC. But they could be swapped here. And it feels like if this was power enable and I could come out and come down and do power enable here. No. Yeah, BCD. So if I come up here with BCD, no, I've got it how I want it. Yeah, what am I talking about? Let's just start. One thing you can do is you just start drawing. Just start, start drawing lines, see what you get. And this is where I can't, I'm not gonna have enough room. Oh, what did it just do there? <laughs> um. Okay, that's an option. The problem is that I got to get. Wait a minute. What? Um. Okay. Why do I have two BCD lines here? Oh, I know why. I know why. Um. Let me just sanity check myself here. In the power block, I'm using BCD. I'm using BCD for two purposes right here. Yeah, one here and one here. They're, they're gonna, it's gonna pull the charge enable line down. It's also gonna pull the enable one line down. Okay. So not only do I have to get it to here, I have to connect these two. That shouldn't be as big of a deal. Can I fit a via right here? No. You know what I can do is I can come out of, I think that'll work. Let's try this with a six mil line. Oh, it's not gonna let me. Oh, it's gonna let me out here though. Oh, I don't wanna go out that way, I wanna go out this way. Um, if I could sneak out here and then come around and then down through here. Hmm. All right. Well, uh, any ideas? Thoughts? It is the time. It is one of the very time consuming parts. And it is where mistakes can happen. Luckily, you do have the the DRC that can check you. You know, is a, is a second set of digital eyes. But um, shoot, I forgot that I'm using it in two places. Let me look. No, that's probably as far as I want to. Battery check break. Let's see how our battery's doing. Oh, look at that. It is just, it's dying slowly, slowly. Uh, we're starting to read 979 milliamps. Let's do a quick check. Let's turn the meter on. Yeah, 
it says we're at 966. Let's wait for the next. Oh, man, look at that, 966. And it just is at 967 on the actual meter. And then the battery at this point, take this off of here. I just put it on the battery lead. We're at 3.83 volts still. All right. Okay, and this equates to 3.83 volts. Isn't that what we were at before? Way up here. Oh, 3.88. Yeah, so it's 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 slowly dying. Okay. All right, battery check done. I love that this is working so well to test the battery. Uh, BCD, super user, great, great question. Um, that is one thing it could stand for, binary coded decimal. In this case, it is not, however. Um, BCD is battery charge detect. And so our FTDI chip, which is responsible for a couple of things, it's this guy right here. You can't see that. It's this one right here. Uh, it's responsible for taking USB signals in and spitting out, um, it's called TTL, um, and I, my brain is, why can't I remember what the TTL is? Anyway, it turns it into the zeros and ones that the ESP32 can understand. And so in comes USB and out comes a TX and RX, which are these lines that come right over here and they come into the TX and RX pins. Uh, it also has the ability to program the output of these special CBUS pins to determine when you've connected a dedicated battery charger like uh, something like this, which is just you plug into the wall, but it has a USB port. So this would be if I plugged this in, the battery charge detect BCD pin will be toggled on that chip so that I can make certain decisions based on that which is different than if I just plug it into an actual laptop or desktop. Um, and so it, it'll help, it helps me change the charge behavior as well as, um, well, specifically the charge behavior, like whether I want the battery to charge or not. So that's what it is in that case. So, hmm, yeah. I have an idea. I have an idea. Okay. I'm going to start deleting things. Well, you know, let's just start deleting things. Um, what if... Why is there a track underneath there? That's dumb. What on earth did I do? Okay, it's not. Okay. I need... Oh, I didn't even realize. That's right, I'm pulling these all up now. I'm pulling BCD up, I'm pulling Power Enable up, and I'm pulling this BCD up. So, all right, let's let's get to work here. We're not we're not being creative enough here. Let's get rid of these trace traces that we were playing with. Okay, let's get rid of this. Okay, okay, uh, and this little guy as well. All right. I forgot before this was not the case. So what we can do here is let's get rid of this via. Let's get rid of this track. All of these are now pulled up to five volts, whereas before they were not. And so let's also get rid of. Uh, um, We can rearrange these resistors a little bit. Now, uh, something for those that are new to this, there's a lot of different symbols going on 
uh, which by the way, you can turn off, like um, I can turn off the front copper just over here. I select that and it just gets rid of all the front copper. Um, but you can see we've got some red, we've got green, we've established that's front and back of the board. The yellow are um, through holes, plated through holes, which means they go all the way through the board and they're, they electrically connect through so you can solder to them. Um, sorry. That's the vias. These, the yellow ones are just, this is, there's a ring on the top here and I believe on the bottom as well. I don't think that they're electrically connected through. Um, is that true? It is true actually. Sorry, I'm, I'm flip-flopping here. These are, they're holes in the boards and they, they go through, you can solder on the top and the bottom. Um, I don't think that they're electrically connected through. That doesn't matter. <laughs> for what I'm trying to get to. This, uh, I don't know what color you'd call this, this aqua blue color is the silk screen. So um, if we look back over at our, uh, I'll get another example board here. Where'd I put it? Oh, right here. So it's all the white that you see. So, you know, like hockey puck up here, it's not gonna zoom. But anyway, all the white, it, it numbers the capacitors and resistors. It helps for just identifying where things are. And then you have this yellow out here. This is the, you gotta switch the camera back. This yellow out here is the board edge. You can see that it's yellow all the way around. And then all of these components have white and not just the, the name, but you can see like these uh, diodes and resistors here, they have this white and that's called the courtyard. And what that is there to help you with is to not place things too close together. And so um, this is about the actual physical size of this diode and this resistor and this resistor right here. Sorry, these are capacitors, C16 and C15. But then also the USB connector has the courtyard way out here as well. But you know that, um, so it helps with, even though that you have room to like run tr traces through here, we can't put a resistor up in here because it's inside the courtyard and you'll get a, you'll get a warning on it and you can choose to ignore it. But in this case, it's not gonna work because if we look at the physical board, like the courtyard is tracing out this micro USB case. And so if we try to place a resistor or a capacitor there, it's not gonna work. And the fab house will normally catch that. They'll, uh, before they run it for you, they'll say, hey, this we can't place the micro USB and the you know capacitor or resistor there because they're gonna run into each other. So um, great. Now, so we can, I was gonna say we can move these resistors. We don't have a lot of room to move them. So what we could potentially do is, first of all, get rid of this via. We don't need that. We could maybe move this resistor up here a little bit, as well as this one. And then, hmm. Because we have access to this five volts anywhere through this where this green comes through. Let's just I hate I hate deleting things because it's like you're undoing work. Um all right. We're gonna get rid of each one of these. And at this case, it doesn't really matter. And this is where the, the rat's nest actually helps you a little bit is it doesn't matter how we connect this pin to this pin and then through these resistors. And now I'm even wondering, do they need to go through separate pull-up resistors? If we're just gonna connect them together, they're both gonna be pulled high. No, they need to have their own pull-up resistor. This one goes through a 10K and this one goes through a 100K. Yeah, they're, they're pulled up differently. Okay.
Oh, yeah. Super user, you got to get on that. Like, bust out an Arduino Raspberry Pi and start making. Start making something. This stuff is so much fun. Highly frustrating and time consuming at times, but a ton of fun. So while these are electrically the same, they have to go through their own pull up resistors. Uh, so which is which, though? I mean, honestly. Should I have them controlled by a separate C bus pin? I think I'm gonna have to think about that one more. I'm not gonna bore you with with that. I'm gonna have to think about how we can do that. Um, as far as these other straggler guys up here. A, uh, let's, uh, let's figure out where we can place those. I think if we move this, can we, can we grab in this view? Ooh, we can. If we just move that over and then move this over like that. Oh, no, we're I'm trying to point to the screen like you can see right down here. You can see how that lights up to let it know that, oh, you're overlapping. So we can't do that. Uh, so let's do right there and then we'll move this like that. Okay, I'm going to hide the front copper for a second. OK, so that's now out of the way. And now. Let's pull these guys over. Um, and then when you're laying these, you're basically trying to create the, the smallest path to where they need to go. So if we scroll in, you can see this needs to go to VBAT. VBAT is down here as well. And so we'd want to not orient it like this. We'd want to make it, we just use the R key. We want to put the VBAT so it's closest uh, like that. So we can do something like that. We're going to make that silk screen way smaller. And then this goes to ground. Now ground is its own special kind of uh, thing because you can see we can get ground pretty much anywhere because once we fill, it'll automatically connect to it. And let me just show that really quick, actually. And then I think we'll probably, we can probably call it. I'm going to put these just like this really close together. Um, and then it's this point right here that we need to get down to way down here to this pin and we can figure that out. Maybe, maybe we'll just connect it to, this is actually the pin right now that the test is using. Um, yeah, this is actually the pin right now that we're using the ADC on. So we could, Well, we, if we need to, we'll reuse that because, as you can see, we can just take a path right over to here and go all the way down right here and connect in. And so we might just run, let's see, we'll run a red one up here. Uh, but see, we can't do green because we've already got green running up there on the back side. We might have to reuse IO32. Okay. Dev board is the second priority here, not the. It's not the the main purpose. Uh, I'm going to mess with these a little bit more. Oh, and I don't actually have to worry about the courtyard. So I just gave you a little speech about the courtyard. The courtyard on this, you can see it's a little bit of a lighter 
it's like a gray, not a white, because it's on the back side of the board. So there's nothing right here on the front side of the board. So we're actually free to just put this resistor like right over here. Totally fine. And then same thing with this. Like that. And then uh, let's fill the thing. And I'm going to show you what I was talking about with that ground. If I hit fill, it's B. B for fill. You see how it creates, let me turn off the back copper so you don't get distracted by the green. It creates these little spokes to ground on any component that needs it. So up here, this one as well, you see how it creates these spokes to it. Um, and then when we control B and we unfill it, it's just, it's hanging out and it's saying, hey, this white line's the rat's nest again, saying I need to be connected to something, but as soon as you fill it, it'll create these spokes for you and you're all connected. So. So when you're when you're laying components, ground is the easiest one to connect because most likely anywhere you are on the board, it'll just create those spokes and you'll be all set. So um, I think I'm losing steam. I'm going to have to think more about the, this BCD. A couple of things I could do is I could um, back over here in the schematic view. We could create another C bus that's a different like BCD one. I really want to just reuse the, the same one though. So I'm going to think about that some more. Uh, the only other thing we need to wrap up. So we need to route that and I'll just, I'll probably just do that. And then the next stream, I'll show you what solution I came up with and then move R1 through R4. And then I'm hoping by, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week, we'll be ready to send this off to PCB Way. As soon as we can get that kicked off to PCB Way, we've got a lot of firmware to write. And so we'll be switching gears over to that. So that's going to do it for the stream today. Really appreciate everybody that dropped in today. Uh, it was great to have a bunch of people um, to chat with. Like, really appreciate everybody that stopped by. Uh, again, if you have any questions about any of this, please let me know. I try to answer all those to help. Uh, other people with their projects and um, if nothing else, give you the, uh, the motivation that you can do this. If I can do it, you can do it. So uh, thanks again so much. I hope everybody has an awesome rest of their evening and a great rest of their weekend. And I uh, will see you back here on Monday.